This paper examines the various efforts to exploit the local coal deposits in the 18th century with a focus on the 1760s and 70s when the mining of coal was combined with salt making. You should now, as I had hoped, be completely familiar with where, how, and uh, what we see today. This was taking place on land owned by the Earls of Sutherland. In the 18th century, the family was quite average in terms of its wealth, or indeed lack of wealth. And the Earls exemplify the desire of landlords in general to supplement their landed income in any way possible. Following over a hundred years of relative silence, a new attempt to exploit the coal was made by William the 17th Earl, who had succeeded in 1733. Far from being isolated, the Earl was connected to coal and salt interests. His mother was a daughter of Morrison of Preston Grange, his wife was a daughter of the Earl of Weems, and he, indeed he was close to General James St. Clair of Roslyn, who lived at Dysart. In 1734, a loan was raised by the Earl, and a former manager of the Countess of Eglinton's coal works in Ayrshire became involved. Two years later, Weems wrote welcoming the news that the Earl had gained the coal. And Weems orders his steward to send whatever colliers north that could be spared. And that at present is all we know of this effort with any certainty. There is then a gap until the late 1740s when the Earl looked to recoup his finances through the coal. John Walkinshaw of that ilk appears on the scene, clearly interested in the coal, but also in the smelting of lead and copper. He was possibly, probably, a drinking companion of the Earl. A William Deere of London was also involved. An engine or horse gin was erected at the pit, three Cornish miners were engaged, and a number of local men were employed as labourers. However, all activity appears to have ceased by the end of 1748. The Earl was known to be a person who was commonly the dupe of rogues and sharpers. <laughs> Mr. Walkinshaw, I'm not quite certain whether he falls into that category, but William Deere almost certainly does. And chronically short of money, the Earl retired to France, where he died in 1750. It was to be another 15 years before another attempt was made to exploit the coal. William, the 18th Earl, had succeeded as a miner, and there was a period when the estate was managed by commissioners. By the late 1750s, the Earl was taking an active interest in the management of his estate. He continued to be hampered by the lack of funds, although this did not prevent his attendance at court. The spur for the renewed exploitation of the coal came from the annexed estates commissioners. They were responsible for managing a number of estates forfeited after the 45 rebellion to encourage development and to bring civilization to the highlands. The commissioners engaged one John Williams to undertake mineral surveys. Williams discovered nothing of economic value in Russia, but he reported a great appearance of coal on the Earl of Sutherland's estate. Lord Kames told the Earl that the commissioners proposed to give all the encouragement that could be expected. As Lord Kames said, the attachment you have to the good of your country will make you zealous to promote this good work. Nor can you overlook private interest. 
coal promotes every sort of industry which by example, imitation and encouragement may spread so fast in Sutherland as to double the rent of your estate in your own time. So enlightenment thinking, patriotic endeavour can indeed be married to personal gain. Terms were eventually agreed with Williams. A loan of £1,000 was to be made available, 700 to be provided by the commissioners and 300 by the Earl. And in 1764, a 19-year lease of the coal work was granted by the Earl with the advice of the commissioners to Williams. Work began with three miners brought up from the Lothians. A trial was undertaken of some coal on the shore before a start was made on clearing out and draining one of the old sinks. Progress was slow as there was only a hand windlass and there was excessive rains. When the bottom of the old pit was reached, it was evident that the previous trial had been on a very small scale. Work was now concentrated on opening up a new pit, but water poured in from a layer of sand and shingle and Williams decided to drain the old pit to see if this would help. When emptying the bucket, one of the colliers fell down the shaft, which was half full of water. He struck his head against the walls and was killed. For Williams, the accident not only meant the loss of one of his three colliers, but it also threw a damp upon the country people, which made them shy of coming to work again for some time. There was, however, one favourable circumstance. The fellow had neither family nor friends to inquire after him. The commissioners were unable to release any funds until they had treasury approval. God knows I knew all about treasury approval as a minor civil servant in the Scottish office. But their overall contribution was essential. The Earl did manage to make some money available. And in March 1765, Williams warned that the small supply of money was nearly used up. The coal was good, but he suggested that salt making be used to, make up, to take up the small coals. He was beginning to throw away as good pan wood as ever was used. By May, a horse gin had arrived, but Williams needed more working capital for gin horses and more colliers. As the estate factor reported, Hands at this season are scarce, and his two colliers troublesome. They had even attempted to escape, but had been pursued and captured at Tain. The commissioners could not help. However, a group of Russia landowners were prepared to advance funds, and this enabled a very relieved Williams to turn down an offer of money from the southern estate because they were looking to renegotiate the terms. With better weather, the hard rock in the new pit was less of an obstacle and the coal seam was soon reached. The seam, I think, was about three foot deep and they're working at probably slightly over 100 feet down. So some of the pictures you see of bell pits, you need to just rethink them a bit. So Williams petitions the commissioners. He wants to put in 20 more colliers to raise coal for sale and he wanted to procure... Uh, get some more gin horses. Finding colliers uh, prepared to come north was not easy. He went to the Lothians, then he went to Fife, and he spent a great deal of money in drinking and procuring colliers. In October 1765, he reported that he had begun to extract coal. However, given the propensity of the coal to disintegrate when it worked, four times as much pan wood or small coals was being produced as compared with chews or great coal. The coal work would be profitable so long as there was sufficient demand for the small coals. 
an unfortunate event showed up a further problem. That autumn he lost over 200 pounds worth of small coals. Laying them on the hill to wait sail, they took fire of themselves and were spoiled. He was convinced that salt manufacture would save the enterprise. The Earl's Edinburgh lawyer told the estate factor to comfort poor John Williams with the good news that the commissioners had decided to give him another hundred pounds. However, the lawyer noted that if the work does not show its own merit and his, more than hitherto, we will all begin to think that, we, that it will never be a going work. And that talking of 70 or 80 colliers for the sole purpose of burning lime or boiling salt pans savours more of project than of serious profit. For God's sake, read him a proper lecture. The death of the Earl in 1766, a tragic event given his young age, left the estate to his infant daughter, and the estate was put in the hands of her tutors, a small group of able and influential men. The commissioners of the Annex Estates decided to give Williams the final instalment under the contract. They did ask the Countess's tutors about the desirability of salt pans, and the tutors were very willing that salt making in Sutherland should be revived. <coughs> Williams was negotiating with some merchants from Port Soy who traded under the name of James Robertson and Company and who had formed a partnership with a Dingwall merchant, Alexander Mackenzie. And this partnership was looking to establish a salt works in Sutherland. In January 1767, the Robertson sent a man who had been in charge of the Weems salt works in Fife to report could Williams provide enough small coals at a reasonable price? And the man reported that the rates agreed on between Williams and the company were rather too high. The Countess's tutors granted a lease to the partnership, uh, which included Williams, granting power to erect what number of salt pans, storehouses, and other necessary offices they shall think proper. And Williams was essentially in charge of both coal and salt works. The pans were set up, but Williams was disappointed with the ironwork, and indeed so defective were the pans that they had to be replaced. The replacements arrived in May 1768, but, so, but took several months to be made up by the local blacksmiths. At the end of July, it was reported that the salt pans were very nearly finished, although there were questions over the method of bringing the salt water to the pans. A few, we few weeks later, Williams could report that salt was being made. And this is confirmed by the regular amounts of small coal which were being consumed by the salt pans from August 1768, increasing in quantity from October. By December, quantities of poor quality parrot coal were also being consumed, sold by the ton. And we know, as Jackie um, has alluded to, the customs vouchers tell the story of the quite surprising productivity of the pans in the period from 68 to 1777. Williams, however, had departed in May 1769. A couple of years earlier, he had been accused by one Catherine Sutherland, alias Kate Oag, as being the father of her child. Whatever the truth of the allegation, it did not look good for Williams, especially as he regularly left the scene before every meeting of the presbytery. 
The Countess's tutors allowed Robertson and company to work the coal on the same terms as Williams. The company gave the management of the coal and salt to a local taxman, Hugh Houston. He was certainly a competent business person. Difficulties were experienced in retaining employees. In September 1775, when Houston was absent, Roderick McLennan absconded and he went to a remote corner of the country to which there is little communication. He went to Durness, of all places. <laughs> Houston claimed that as McLennan was master of the salt pan, the pan had lain idle. And McLennan did indeed acknowledge a debt, which appears to be for wages up front. Production continued into the spring of 1777, when it came to an abrupt end. There were problems with the sulfurous qualities of the coal, which damaged the iron of the salt pans. Essentially, it was about a supply of coal of adequate quality at the right price. There was talk of new pits. There was talk of a water wheel or even a steam engine. But the company didn't have the capital uh, to invest. The estate took action to end possession by the colliers and salters of their lands in the Dole just to the south. There were a number of colliers and three salters, William Bailey, John McRitchie, and John Dingwall, described as salters in Brora and possessors of houses and crofts in Dole. It's interesting to note these, these possessions are described as crofts or individual small holdings, a genuine instance of early crofts. We should not, however, assume that these crofts were still in existence at the time of the large-scale reorganisation of the estate in the early 19th century. By the autumn of 1778, the company was disposing of its assets at Brora. Within four years, the company was in financial trouble. But I'm now straying into Port Soy, and that's the territory of the next speaker. Thank you.